Thank you so much, Corinna. I'm happy to be here. So exciting to be reaching out to this amazing group across the country. My name is Wendy Smith. I'm founder and CEO of Sargent Solutions. Sargent Solutions is uh, fills the gap in the non-for-profit space, really focusing around fundraising support, finance, database management, uh, in a way that solves problems for charities across the nation, both in the U.S. We have clients in all Canadian provinces and 26 states across the U.S. We are a BlackBaud uh, partner, and um, we have been in business since 2006. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about me because we have a great amount of content here for us today. I'm going to start with a fun little video that will kick off our topic for today. I find that video hilarious because when people started switching to work in the virtual environment and started having cameras, all kinds of things that we were seeing, although we've been virtual since 2016, we started to see with cameras and everything of our clients, all these different scenarios. So we put together that fun little video just uh, as a little awareness to people, things to pay attention to when you're working with yourself. I'd next like to start with a, a land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that the geographic area I work in is located on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe, Chippewa, of the, um, of the Anishinaabe group of Indigenous peoples. As a community, we have the responsibility for stewardship of the land on which we live and work. We recognize and deeply appreciate the Indigenous historic connection to this place and the agreement with the Crown of Canada to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The agenda to today is going to be just a quick introduction, which I think we've had. We're going to talk about how to keep your team motivated, managing tasks and workload, virtual interactions with donors, clients, and team members. And then we're going to have some time at the end for some questions. As I mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of Sargent Solutions. We've been using the BlackBot suite of products for over 20 years, and we have a vast team with a varying different degrees of knowledge. We're going to start today with a little poll. So we want to know what are your organization's biggest struggles? Great, Wendy. So um, I've got the poll up on the screen now for everyone. Um, so I'd love it if uh, all of our participants today could take a moment and just go ahead and vote on your screen. So what are your organization's biggest struggles? We have lack of resources, lack of training, leadership, lack of processes, and staff turnover. And I know some of you may say more than, more than just one, but if, if you can just pick one, that would be great. So we'll just give a moment here so that everyone gets a chance to uh, participate in the poll. And we find that those are the biggest, you know, most of the areas that organizations are struggling with. Some have been exaggerated as a result of COVID, the pandemic, working virtually. It's nice to be able to be able to ask a question of a bigger group so that we can all sort of see that we're not alone. So your struggle is going to be shared with probably a lot of other people. And I think it's important, especially in this time, to recognize that you're not alone in, in your struggles and what's happening, because everyone is faced with, with a struggle of some sort or another. 
That's great. So, Wendy, I'm going to share the poll with with the group here. Um, so it looks like uh, we're tied at the top for lack of resources and lack of processes at 27 percent. Next, we have staff turnover at 21 percent. And then we have um, kind of a tie here, lack of training at 13 percent and leadership at 12 percent. Perfect. That's not a lot different than what I would anticipate those answers to be. So thank you so much for participating. Managing a virtual team. As we've seen over the past almost two years now, uh, things have been a struggle with managing a virtual team. And I want to talk today about leadership because a lot of things start at the leadership level and leadership really should align everyone in your organization with a clear and compelling vision. In the office, that was true, but even more so when you're working remotely. The challenge is this is a, a big adjustment, has been a big adjustment for your team. What happened in the office doesn't always translate to what happens in a remote environment. So sometimes you have to stand back and look at the bigger picture as to what really needs to happen and do some of the things that we do in the office. Are they still necessary? Are they just things that happen in the office because it's always been done that way? So it's a really it has been a really good time for organizations to really stand back and say, you know, are we doing this because we've always done it that way? Or is this what makes the most sense now in our environment? Your team is juggling added responsibilities when working from home, their teachers, their parents, their team members, and plus, plus, plus. They really are trying to manage a lot. There has to be a focus more on goals during this time of people working at home and not on actual time spent. That traditional nine to five or 8.30 to 4.30 really is difficult to manage on a virtual, with a virtual team. Number one, you don't have any control over it and nor should you have control over it. But I think you need to be able to say that these people are going to potentially have to be a, a teacher for a moment in time. They need to be able to, you know, take a minute for their mental health and really be able to focus on what they need to focus on in that moment. That might not be your organization because they're, they're having struggles getting their Zoom to work for their, their kids' class at that moment. So really, that might mean that they're at nine o'clock at night trying to catch up after the kids have gone to bed on what they missed during the day. So having a flexible schedule allows for people to be more in tune and be able to really focus on what they need to focus on for work in the moment that they need to focus on it and allowing them the flexibility to also be able to try and juggle the 47,000 other balls that they have in the air at that time. Keeping the team motivated. A team is hard to get motivated if they don't have clear and attainable goals. They need to know what the overall goals are for the organization. Do you have monetary goals? Do you have KPIs set up to be able to say, this is, this is what we set to accomplish in this quarter. I like to break things down by quarter, but you can break them down in six months. You can break them down by month, depending on the type of project or situation that you have. But overall organization goals, you should have sort of benchmarks that you're working towards overall. Then you should have goals for each specific department. Some of you are a one man show or one woman show or one person show and therefore you're not going to have departments, but have those goals set for yourself and for your departments if you have them so that you know if you're meeting things, if you need to adjust and maneuver into something else, you'll be able to have a much better, much better goal of, of where you are at with that if you set a goal. KPIs set your team up for success. Are projects completed on time and on budget? Are they utilizing all of the tools and resources that you have available? Now, noticing that, you know, 27% of you said you have a lack of resources. So that will, uh, that obviously does affect your ability to be successful in some ways. Is the communication clear? Is it friendly? We've been working with charities since 2006. And one of the things that we find the most shocking is that Sometimes people just aren't friendly to each other. And for an environment that wants 
to do an environment for a genre of of places that want to so badly help the world most of us don't get into not-for-profit or into philanthropy uh, for our own self purposes we get into it because we want to we want to make a difference sergeant's mission is to help charities help the world that's what we do every day that's what we want and so because we're in this environment you know you would automatically think that everyone is friendly but often how we talk to each other as a team is is not so friendly so focusing on having clear and friendly and timely communication is really key to success imagine if you could take all of that energy that you're projecting and turning it into collaboration versus turning it into you know frustration are you working as an organization with a donor in mind what i mean by that is sometimes you everyone is trying to make it as as efficient as possible for you yourself but think about it from the donor perspective they don't know what your work environment is and unless they're really closely involved with your office they don't really know what's happening there and it's not really their job to know what they need to know is is it easy for them to give you money you want to make sure that it's super easy for them to give you money what do i mean by that Am I making them fill out scads and scads of information in order to make a donation? Or am I treating them as if I already know who they are? Am I asking them for the amount that they gave last time? Am I doing all of those things? Additionally, am I making them click 14 different times to get to the donate now button on my website? Super simple things, but can turn a donor off really quickly. I always like to put that in because I find that a lot of organizations work hard to make it really easy for the team sometimes, but make it twice as difficult for the donor. And I think you really have to balance that out, make it really easy for the donor, and also try and make it really easy for the team. You need to have training. You need to be able to have training to be able to know what it is that you need to do. Lots of times there's no overlap back in the olden days and I'm aging myself now, but back in the olden days, you left an organization and they had hired someone that you trained for two weeks before you left. I can't remember the last time I heard of that ever happening. So having training manuals or procedures and things documented so that everybody has a clear understanding. Have autonomy. Do you know what decisions you have the ability to make yourself? Is that clear to you? Or is there a bottleneck because you have to wait for approval, wait for approval, wait for approval? Get a good understanding of what decisions you're allowed to make on your own and be confident in making them. Have a budget. You know, some organizations don't share the budget with the people who actually need to meet the budget. I would highly recommend sharing that budget information. Again, that talks to the goals. You need to know what your budget is. You need to know whether you're making it. You need to know if you're partway there, all the way there, or getting there, and celebrating that you're, you've, you've met your revenue goals and um, haven't spent all of your expense budget. That's an amazing thing to celebrate as a team. And often, we're just go, 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 go. And we don't take the time to celebrate the successes that we have as an organization. Take time to celebrate, especially when you're working remotely where everybody is in a different uh, situation, different place. We need to take that time to celebrate. Proper training will make your team members feel more confident in their work. Knowing how to do the tasks will allow them to work more efficiently and they'll be able to reinvent what is needing to happen because they'll be able to have a good understanding a solid understanding of where they're at provide a tra training timeline for new employees so don't just have them start and dump them and hope for the best kind of have that you know short leash is a, is not the necessarily a, a nice word but it just kind of gives you a visual keep them close and and make sure that they're really confident and feeling good about what they need to do uh, when they're first on board with you give your team space to achieve their goals micromanagers 
And I have never seen a situation where a micromanager is truly effective. In your mind, if you're a micromanager, you might think so, but you're really struggling, you're, you're literally suffocating your team by being that, if you are that. Team members will work better when they don't feel micromanaged. They, you know, do they know what success looks like? So as a leader, I like to outline, this is what success looks like for this project. Now, if that happens, amazing. If that doesn't happen, I also know that that team member is probably learning from those mistakes and therefore I don't need to berate the fact that there was a bunch of mistakes. Giving them, giving them an inch will want people to work a mile. When it comes to budget, you need to give departments a realistic budget. You can't set a goal that's not gonna happen. And then when things happen like COVID, you know, reassessing what that looks like now in a today's, I mean, obviously when you've approved it from the board, you can't necessarily change it, but you know that you're probably not gonna need it. Instead of thinking about that, going, well, what can we do? And start working on what you can do. What I found is those organizations that continued to ask for money during COVID got money. Those that decided they weren't going to do that didn't get money. And those are the organizations that are struggling more today than the ones that kept going and adjusting and pivoting to new, new information from donors. Implement budget tracking programs so that everyone knows where they're at all the time. And if they are part of the creation of the budget, they will have more buy-in to achieving it. So don't just tell them what they need to do. Let them tell you what they need to do. And then sometimes it might not be enough. You might need to negotiate, but sometimes they might surprise you. Often when I give people a goal, they come back with more than what I was going to expect from them. So if you give them the ability, let them tell you what they can do, because often they're more capable to do what you think they are. They will always surprise you. Next, we have a little poll that's just going to talk about as offices start to open again, where do you prefer to work? So we're most curious about this because we love working remotely. We've worked remotely for a really long time, but we're hearing a lot of mixed messages amongst the group. So we thought we would take this poll today to find out how everyone's feeling about that. It's a great time to do that check-in, Wendy. So um, just go ahead and once again, feel free to vote on your screen. So we've got, as offices start to open again, would you prefer to work at your work office, at your home office, or a hybrid of a home and a work office? Wonderful. So we've got the majority of folks have voted. So I'm just going to close and share this. And I think this may not be surprising that we've got 75% saying a hybrid of home and work. We've got 18% saying at your home office and 7% at your work office. Interesting. That, that's surprising. I actually thought the home number would be a little bit higher, a little bit higher, but I think people do like the social interaction and we're gonna talk about that in a couple minutes. Managing tasks and workload. So, Feeling like you need to discuss the expectations. How are you handling home from home situations? Example, child pops into the Zoom meeting. How, are, how do your employees know how to handle these things when they happen? How, how, do you have guidelines around you know, those types of things? If they're in a call with a client, if they're on an internal call, go over ways to avoid situation and what you can do so it can be avoided. For example, you know, we've had employees that work with us with children. We, you know, have them just if they're on an outside meeting with a client that they just announce at the beginning of the call, you know, I have a child at home that's unpredictable. I'm not sure what's going to happen. If you see my video go dark and I go on mute, I'm still here. I just might need to be dealing with another situation. That is just everybody then up front knows everything. And what you'll see as you, you know, learn to know me a little bit better, I'm all about communication. I don't think you can over communicate. You can overshare sometimes, but I don't think you can over communicate. How to manage added elements in the daily work life. So we talked about that flexibility of time. You know, working from home can bring up so many distractions that I'm sure we have all lived with. 
how can your team adjust their time management? And, you know, sort of I talked about stop expecting sometimes that nine to five. Do you have times of the day where it's important for everybody to get together? Example, we have a morning mashup at 9.15. We have, we have staff members across the time zones. So we have found 9.15 is a time that works for us. And we meet for 15 minutes every morning and we call it the morning mashup. I think we stole it from a radio station, but don't tell them. And we just chat about, you know, each of the department managers talk about sort of the some each week, each day, they have a day where they sort of do their update about what's going on. So the whole team understands what that is. And it starts out that meeting starts out with a little joke, which is a great way to start the day. It also we have it on video where you know it gives people sometimes people have a hard time working from home sometimes and you can actually see that in that 18 percent number with the poll is that extra motivation to be on camera at 9 15 in the morning motivates people to get up get ready get organized for work as if they were going out somewhere to work and that is helpful for people to feel like they're more in the zone of versus just rolling out of bed and trying to start their day in the meeting uh, with the camera off. We do it that way. So having uh, some allotments for those kinds of things is super helpful. And then at the end of our morning mashup, we just have a quick like who needs to connect with who today and that we're a very collaborative team. So who needs to connect with who and then they we kind of make a little bit of arrangement about how that's going to happen and what time works for who all needs to connect. And then, you know, we are off to our day. Super helpful. Implement a project management tool if you need one to keep track. I know some of you use Asana, Monday, you know, we use Teamwork, uh, but there's different ones that you can use. And tracking the projects and tasks as they progress so that you have clear expectations of deadlines to ensure everything keeps moving along. Some people feel that you have to be, some managers feel that you have to be in the office. I have to see you at your desk to know that you're working. Little do they know that you could be sitting at your desk all day long and not have done a stitch of work. I've seen that happen. So where your location is really doesn't matter about your productivity. It's more about the kind of person that you are. And there needs to be a lot more trust in organizations that people are working. If I were to sit and think about, you know, my team, and if I had for one minute worry that they weren't working or they weren't doing what their expectations were, that, that's something different where, you know, I have to trust that they're doing what they want to do and what they, you know, set out the, and said what they would do. And that goes a long way in them producing results for the organization in the best interest of our organization. Does it still apply virtually? So just because it worked in the office does not mean it's gonna work virtually. Is your team running in circles trying to do the things the same way, even though there's now five more steps involved? So sometimes it's where you've gotta blow things up in order to do that. And I think too, it's not unfair to find out or kind of investigate what does going back to work look like? Is there a plan in place? So if you're a leader, have you thought about how to reintegrate potentially a hybrid work environment? Are you gonna offer people the opportunity to work from home? Are you gonna make sure that they have to come back into the office? Knowing that if you hardline that, that they have to come back in the office, that you might lose people. We're, for example, we're in the process of hiring people right now. And three of the applicants and the last three people that I interviewed said, you know, we're looking at going back to the office and one of the big reasons why they wanna look for a job is because we are virtual. So are you gonna be losing people at your organization if you're hardlining them to come back to the office? Just keep in mind. Take time to review your processes and ask staff what's working and what's not working so that they know, so that you are listening to what they are saying because they probably have a lot of ideas about how that hybrid office situation can work. Don't think that you have to solve all of those problems as a leader, potentially yourself. Be consistent. Create a consistent strategy for your files and folders. 
get team members feedback on your strategy. I'm all about collaboration. So as you know, as the presentation goes on, I'm sure you're seeing that. I involve the team in a lot of decisions that we make because it then becomes our idea. And we are definitely stronger together than we are as individuals. Keep checking in. So I sometimes, you know, have lunch with different people, encourage people to have lunch dates via Zoom, you know, or go for a walk, you know, have a walking co competition, do mixers, things like that to keep people engaged in, you know, working together and collaborating as a team. Use collaboration documents, keep folders in a drive that can be shared across teams. Project management tools will also allow for that. You know, we use teamwork spaces and that allows for collaboration and edits, Google Docs, things like that that people use. You know, can highlight edits and changes and take revision notes within documents. That helps people, you know, be able to be working on the same thing all together. Having the right tools so invest in the right project management software, which I've said, brainstorm ways to keep everyone connected and on top of their work, inspire your team. So it, and what that means is we do a mixer. There's a game called Haig. It's, um, I think it's from the Netherlands and it's just conversation. There's three questions on each card. It's not, not a board or anything, but there's three conversations, three, questions on each card and we do a mixer we have our mixer tonight actually it's one hour at the end of our day and we just break everybody up into breakout rooms and everybody has a question that they get to ask in that breakout room and then everybody gives their answer and it's a way for teams to get to know each other some we're a mixture of introverts and extroverts so sometimes nobody needs the question it just invokes a general conversation but the questions are a good framework to get to know people and it's funny you know when we come back into the into the room that you know people are talking about you know the different aspects and it's a great way to build the team even though you're not physically together we have people on the team that i personally have never physically met in person so it's a you really need to find ways to be able to collaborate and work together again i said we use teamwork remind your team when to not work so you do have to, because of this whole work-life balance and things that are happening, you want to make sure that your team's mental health is also being cared for. You know, encourage them to take lunches, and allow them to take vacation time, remind them to have a little bit of fun. You know for a fact <laughs> when people are working in the office how much time is stopped talking in cubicles or in offices and different things where people need to kind of escape from the monotony of what they're doing in that moment. So encourage them to have a little bit of fun and encourage them to take breaks when they need to take breaks because you know that they're, the more you develop their mental health, the more that they're going to be grateful for that. And that builds loyalty to your organization. And you have a lot of really important work to do. So you want to make sure that you've got people who are buying into that work, but not feeling like you're killing them with a baseball bat over and over again to get to work. Ask your team. So count on them to create a system that is going to work for everyone. And sometimes you might need to make variations to that. You've got, you know, people with kids, people who are looking after seniors, people who are empty nesters, people who, you know, have different situations. So you, you want, it might not be the system that's going to work for everyone static, but it might be a, a hybrid of different things that are going to work for different people. And ask for feedback. And definitely, without a doubt, show your appreciation. Don't be afraid to say thank you. So we use Microsoft Teams. We have a chat. We have an acronym for our team. So it's KTOA. We feel that we're the killer team of awesomeness. I'm letting you, this is an inside secret. We have t-shirts that say KTOA on them. And we have a chat in our teams that's KTOA. And anyone can go in there and just kudos to, you know, someone who did something nice for them, someone who, you know, despite it wasn't their job, helped them out with something else. And it's a great way to build collaboration. It's a great way to build camaraderie. And it's a great way to just say thank you, which is often what we need to be doing more than not. 
virtual interactions. So phone calls allow for more, you know, for conveying more genuine tone. Turn on the video when possible. Give that, give people the in-person feel. You know, with your donors, you could be setting up Zoom. They have these capabilities more so than not nowadays. Uh, even my mom, who's 82, has Facebook portal, right? So there are things, because she's been so isolated through the pandemic, it's a great way for us to have interaction and make her feel not alone. Lots of times people are afraid to call their donors. They'll send an email, they'll send a letter, they'll do something different. Don't be afraid to call them up because especially right now, if they are you know, at home and have been at home and alone for a long time, they're gonna give you insights and information more so than you would ever realize. Additionally, if you're calling your colleagues or you know, doing it through video chat, you're gonna get a more uh, sense of how they're feeling about something in text or in email sometimes there's uh, a tone that you're interpreting that isn't correct and that phone conversation will really clear that up for you daily check-ins so touch base with your employees at least once throughout the week you know check in with your colleagues if you know that somebody is introverted and their job is really isolated to themselves don't leave them isolated to themselves. Try to pull them into some other things, make them feel like they're part of a group and don't just leave them to the sidelines. Don't only focus on work, but also focus on the accomplishments of the work that you're doing globally as a team. Be, again, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate the things that you're doing really well and what you've accomplished despite of all of the things that are trying to knock, knock you down right now. Ask, them how they are managing and what they need for success so sometimes it's you know a mental health day <laughs> sometimes it's they need a new office chair sometimes it's something totally different so don't be afraid to ask the questions that they need for different for different aspects of things Team meetings, start interval meetings with a joke to maintain positivity and lift morale. Since we did this, now our joke teller on our team, and you can rotate it, we have the same one, and she kind of elaborates now to this huge little story, and it's very off the wall. Often the joke is not funny, but that makes us laugh even more. And it's a fun way to start because then we can poke a little bit of fun at her about her joke, and it's it's a great way to build camaraderie. Meet with the team regularly to keep everybody informed. Often what happens is decisions get made and that information doesn't transfer back. So if there's a group meeting or you have a management meeting or there's a sub meeting of something, uh, charities are famous for millions of meetings. So if you are having those meetings and you're having information, find out what's the objective for the meeting and find out what is your role with the information now that you're sitting in this meeting. Is it your job to go back to your team and tell them what the outcomes are from that meeting? Or is it gonna get communicated as a whole with everyone else? How does everyone know? How will everyone in the organization know that that decision has been made or that this new process has been developed? Make sure you understand how, what is your role in keeping everyone informed? It's not just one person's responsibility to do that. Time zone differences. So this may be or may be not applicable to you, but we work across the different time zones with different clients. Virtual work allows for uh, charities to do business with donors and clients across different time zones. The other thing it does, if you allow your team to be flexible, is often we're getting calls at night from donors that go to a voicemail. You know, does someone, are you able to shake that up a bit and have it where someone answers the phone, you know, in the evening? Or does that get rotated amongst the team? They get forwarded the phone for different situations and different times so that they can have those meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations with donors. It does provide valuable insight to your organization if you actually have a live person answer your phone. Be aware that courtesy, courte courteous of all time zones when booking meetings. So if you have different people in different time zones, make sure that you're accommodating those things. 
for example, I'm not going to book a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning knowing that I have staff out west. That's not very fair to make them come in that early to a meeting. 915 is about as far as I feel like I can push it. And that's early enough. And I don't have anybody in BC, but I have someone in uh, Manitoba, which does, you know, is only an hour difference, but it can still be a difference. Be thoughtful when you're, you know, connecting with donors and when you're connecting with staff in various different areas. Maintaining office culture, trying to host in person get togethers when possible, you know, when that's allowed. If you choose to become a full on virtual team at the end of all of this, you know, don't forget about how important it is to connect in person from time to time. Encourage social hours, getting everyone together for some virtual fun, questions, games, breakout rooms, those kinds of things really help keep the team connected. A couple of other things that I wanted to just mention that are not in the in the presentation that, you know, kind of this virtual environment as we start to work out with all of the different charities involved is what it what, what everyone is doing as a result of you know the virtual environment right now one of the things that we found most important is that most charities have just kind of got everybody a computer and got everybody a webcam and speakers and now they're good to go there wasn't really any clearly defined guidelines expectations of what really should happen and i think if you're going to move full time into a hybrid even or into that don't be afraid to start having those conversations about what that should look like. And if you're not the leader and you're the, the person who is doing that, you're still part of a team. And I think it's important to be part of a team to kind of be part of the solution. So if you have great ideas about how that can work, then don't be afraid to share those ideas. And I know there can be a lot of leaders out there, especially I find in the charity world that are have come up the ranks from they've been great amazing fundraisers but then they become a leader and they are stuck in leaders leadership and aren't really working as a collaborator anymore in those cases i know sometimes it's hard to bring their ideas forward but be persistent and uh, try to be the person who is part of the solution and not part of the problem but I do want to make sure that I'm leaving enough time for some questions at the end. And it would be really nice if there were some things where people had some comments about situations that maybe you want to talk about that we could uh, potentially try and solve for you here today. That's fantastic. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so we've got some great questions coming in and I encourage everyone to keep them coming as we uh, work through this Q&A period. So here's a really good one, Wendy. How do you balance social and work? Um, and the example that was given by the participant is that they have heard staff comments that are in line with, why should I take an hour for social when I could spend that hour getting my work done? So that's a great question. And I feel like I have a team that wants to work hard, but also, you know, play hard. And I think there's lots of reasons why people, <laughs> that's a really good question because I feel like our work is never done. We're always, I, I feel like we're always just 13 steps behind. We don't have enough people to do the volume of work that we have. So for us, that is a real situation. So I can 100% relate with that. But if we don't encourage the team to take that social hour at the time, and I cut it out of their day, so I'm not asking them to stay an hour extra, I cut it out of their day so that, you know, it starts at four o'clock to five o'clock so that it's not five o'clock to six o'clock because I don't want to cut into their family time. That's already enough of a, you know, that's already hard enough to balance. But I encourage them to do that social time. It's not mandatory, but everyone wants to come because Quite often, you just need to have a mental break. My team will be the first to tell you that often they do not take lunch. And then we, you know, we started this daily lunch uh, agenda meeting. It's not a real meeting, but it's in everybody's teams. 
right? We use Microsoft Teams. It's in everybody's Teams. And you can pop in and have lunch with your colleagues if you want to or not. Often there's one person on the team who has lunch by herself, but it, she leaves the chat open. And sometimes I'll pop in and go, oh, hey, how's it going? How's your day going? And you just do that. You need that social piece. So I would say if you have people who don't want to do it and want to just get their work done, work is still going to be there tomorrow. Unless it's something like, okay, I have to charge credit cards on the 15th of the month and I didn't get it done and it's the 15th. That's a different situation. That's an urgent situation. But for the most part, the work is still going to be there tomorrow and one hour out of your time for mental health and collaboration with your team is going to make you better. It's going to make your team better and it's going to make your organization more successful. I don't know if that helps, but that's how I feel about it. I love that idea, Wendy, and that, that, uh, sense that you need those break times for mental health. You absolutely have to have them. If you don't, you're, you're just putting your mental health more at risk. And I have seen people over the last two years that I have worked with, with for 10 years that have not had issues with mental health or anything that are having those issues now. Everything is an extra strain for people right now. They're trying to juggle a lot of balls. And I mean, there was a lot of balls before, let's be honest. Now it seems like there's even more. And I'm super lucky. I'm an empty nester. I'm a grandma. I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of those pressures, but I see those pressures on my colleagues. I see those pressures on the, my clients that I'm working with in collaboration. And they didn't have those struggles before and it's just did, done that little bit extra and you need to take those breaks because otherwise you are going to kill yourself. I couldn't agree more. And I'll say that um, just from the Charity Village perspective, we had a 90-minute uh, team lunch yesterday, actually, with, that we're doing on a regular basis. And it was uh, fantastic. I think I heard from everyone across the team how much they appreciated not just seeing everyone, but being able to just take that breather, take that little break from work and and just have some social time together and, and celebrate some of the, the accomplishments that we've had as well. It's, it's so important yeah. to do that. So here's a question um, about um, uh, managing. So um, this attendee says, I understand, you know, the point about being flexible and trusting. Absolutely. But what about when you're starting to find that people are not meeting expectations? Um, is that time to micromanage or do you have other tips for how to um, manage a situation like that? So I'm not really a micromanager. I think I might have been a hundred years ago, but I really have learned that that doesn't, isn't helpful, but definitely you have expectations of things and people need to do their work. This is not a free for all. Don't misunderstand my, you know, you know, um, <laughs> what's the, what's the word, you know, my, my kindness for lack of, you know, you need to get to work. As a result of that, you still have to have, and that's where the KPIs and the setting the goals is, is super important. So if you have people who, where you've set the goals and they're just not meeting the mark, meeting the mark, that's having a conversation. What's going on, right? I noticed that for the last two months, you've not been meeting your goals, your KPIs, you, things are slipping. Talk to me about what's going on. Sometimes there's something going on and you need to figure out what you wanna do about that as a leader. Or it's just no longer working for them in, 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 in an environment. And sometimes some people just can't work from home. Or sometimes people just, you know, feel like if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. And that's when you have to take a long, hard look about whether they are a good fit for your organization. Because maybe they're not. And I am not a fan of keeping people that are sucking the life out of the rest of your team. So I will protect my team like a bulldog uh, if something goes wrong. You know, if I have someone who is, is treating my team in a racist way or in any sort of way that is not acceptable to our culture for our organization, I am firing that client. 
so I think that you have to be true to your team and your organization culture and your vision and keep the people who will want to maintain that and get rid of the people who don't. That sounds harsh, but it is the only way to be successful. Thanks, Wendy. And moving from that to kind of the opposite of, of onboarding. So we've had a question about um, bringing on a new remote employee who's new to the team. And in this particular instance is actually um, kind of a first step in their career. So, you know, very, very new to this type of work. Um, do you have any tips for um, how to connect and motivate that person um, to help them have concrete deliverables, et cetera? I often, that's where I ask them to deliver what they think their KPIs are going to be for starting out, whether that's the, what's hap, what do they expect to do? What do they expect to be able to accomplish in the first three months, first six months, first nine months, first, you know, in the first year. Also, that's where we do a four week agenda for them so that they know exactly where they, what's going to happen each day for them, who they're going to be mentoring or shadowing, who, excuse me, who who they're going to be, what resources do they need to read, what do they need to understand, what is their, you know, and based on their KPIs, working together with them for that sort of first month to make sure that they're just not dangling out there by themselves, sitting at their desk going, I don't know what to do next. You want to make sure that they're set up for success. And that is a difference between, you know, micromanaging and, you know, onboarding. So onboarding is that whole short leash kind of approach where you need to kind of give them a little bit, let them set what they think they can do. Often it's more than you think that the, more than what your expectations are, quite honestly, I've not seen it the other way before. And have, have them be able to, you know, then work with them to set up a, a schedule on how they can make that happen and what resources do they need. And don't just leave them off to their own devices sitting at their computer wondering what to do, because they definitely won't be successful that way. We do a lot of shadowing. So if we're if we're doing something with a, you know, a particular project for a client and the person who we've just hired is going to be is needs to see that skill set from our perspective on how we do that, then they would shadow in that moment there. So they would be on part of all of the calls. They would see that project all the way through from start to finish. They wouldn't necessarily be involved in it. They're definitely not billing the client for it, but they're just kind of shadowing. So when you bring people on, give them time to get settled before you just hammer down the expectations. Awesome. Um, okay, so here's a great question, and I think we could look at this from an individual perspective and from the leadership side. Um, how do you manage feeling a sense of burnout when trying to work at home on a computer for prolonged periods of time? You know, you're online for seven or eight or maybe even longer hours a day. Um, is that where that building that social time really comes into play, or are there other things that um, can be done to, to help break that up a little bit? <laughs> so what I do, and everybody does different things, I'm not a huge, like I would love to do yoga, but I don't think I'm coordinated enough for yoga. It would be a disaster if you kind of saw me do yoga. But what I do is I tend to take little breaks throughout the day. So I have a brand new puppy, so I play with my puppy for a few minutes. I also, <laughs> what I love to do the most is I will just for 10 minutes set a timer on my phone I will rock out with, I have downloaded these crazy, like I call it lunchtime boogie tunes, but because I sometimes do it at lunch, but I also do it, you know, different times. And it's just like old music that's really got a really great beat. And I just like dance it out. And that really is a huge stress reliever. And I try to also take a couple minutes. And when I am feeling uh, things, for example, like I'm feeling irritated, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm angry, all of those things. I try to immediately move into what I I'm call a sage response. And I'm trying to then think about things. Okay, how can I see this with patience, compassion, curiosity, positivity, empathy, creativity? And that kind of immediately shifts me into a more positive state of mind because mindset really is everything i don't know if that's helpful but don't be afraid to take i would much rather 
people take, you know, those little five minute, 10 minute breaks throughout the day to feel better about sitting at the computer all the time. And the other thing, which is really great, which I, I did not do, but I have computer glasses. So these computer glasses by far uh, make things look a little bit bigger and a little bit brighter. They've got a blue light on them and they actually help quite a bit. So it kind of peps me up a bit. Hopefully that's helpful. That's great, Wendy. Um, I love it. And I, I love your, um, your comments around mindfulness. And, and I think uh, what it brings to mind for me is that that sense of being self-aware when you realize you're reaching that, that place. And I know for me personally, it's, it's getting out for a short walk or just getting outside for a few minutes is, is often what, what I need to do. And I can tell when that time hits around two o'clock in the afternoon, that's, that's usually when I need it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you can feel yourself starting to feel those things that irritated, frustrated, you, you know, you're, oh, I'm a little bit short on that or this. The other thing that we do too is we have a tool we use Grammarly. I don't know if any of you use it, but it's something that I've purchased for the whole team. And basically it kind of adjusts your flavor in your emails. It makes sure that all your grammars correct your spelling, but it also tells you the mood of your email. So if you have to send something that's particularly challenging or you have to do something, it gives you that little mood flavor in the bottom right hand corner of the message. And it really helps make sure that you one are sending out information that's reflective of how you actually want to say it, because I'm pretty sure you don't want to say it in a bad way. Uh, and that kind of helps too. But if I'm starting to feel any of those kinds of feelings about irritation and frustration and stuff, and I that's a really good indicator for me as well to just take a breather for a minute, walk away. <laughs> Even if it's just go up and down the stairs, get a fresh glass of water and or, you know, a flavored coffee, something that makes you feel special. That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the update meetings um, and having regular check ins. So um, first of all, what do you think? Uh, I know you've talked a little bit in the presentation about the importance of having those those check in points. Um, you know, should the team be sharing a little bit about what they've completed or what they're working on that day? Does that border on micromanaging? Um, and how do we make sure that um, these sort of standing meetings don't become uh, quote unquote time wasters for folks as well? So I'm a really big fan of like 15 minute meetings because I think once you get beyond that, it gets really crazy because number one, I hate it when I get called into a meeting or I go see a client. The first 10 minutes is a sports conversation. I hate that. Um, number one, because I don't like sports. And number two, just I feel like it's such a waste of time when I think about the dollars sitting around the table. So I'm very aware of the dollars sitting around the table, especially because I charge my clients. So I want to make sure I'm not charging them to talk for, to listen to them talk about sports for 10 minutes. So I'm a fan of like, get in, get out, do what you need to do and say what you need to say. So on our team meeting in the morning, so we have marketing talks for on Mondays, you know, programs talks on Tuesdays, everybody have finance and admin talks on Wednesday, and then I talk on Thursdays and we don't have it on Fridays. So in that moment, they have like a few minutes to talk about one, maybe they need to do, you, we use it for brainstorming around, maybe uh, Riley's our marketing manager, maybe he has some ideas about something that he wants to present to the group and he wants to get some feedback. So he, we might use that 10 minutes as a brainstorming session we that or he has something exciting that he wants to share he will then do a celebration it's not structured enough that it's like oh riley update us on the 50 projects you're working on that's micromanagement to me he knows what he needs to do he knows where he's at he's going to celebrate the things with the rest of the team that he wants to celebrate and he knows what he also needs to improve upon if if there's something that way as well but that doesn't need to be i don't think shared amongst the group so I believe that it really should be focused around celebrations, collaboration, you know, and not so structured that, you know, it becomes time wasting because everybody knows the projects that they need to do. That's what a project management tool does. But, uh, you know, and each person, each person who is reporting to someone should report to that person, but just on a quick update, this is going well, this is what I need help with. You know, do I have any roadblocks? Yeah, I have a roadblock. I, I can't, I need to reach this volunteer and they're not getting back to me. I need your help with trying to facilitate that. Okay, great. I can do that. So it's just 
those quick points on, you know, every all my projects are going really well, everything's moving along, looks like I'm going to meet my budget, I'm going to meet my timelines, but I need help in this one area. That's a productive meeting in my mind. Wonderful. And that's a great note, I think, to end things on today, Wendy. Uh, really great, positive uh, look at that. Uh, did you have any final comments before we sign off? I just really want to thank everyone for signing up and joining me today in this session. It's uh, although I can't see anyone and I'm just looking at those slides. It's nice to know that you're out there in virtual land. And I just want to say be kind to yourself and give yourself a minute sometimes when you need it. And don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. And don't be afraid to give your ideas because often the person who you're reporting to could use the help too. And I think each of us has a very unique opportunity and knowledge and experiences to share. And that really should be shared. So that's all I have. Well, that's great. And we want to thank you, Wendy, for a great presentation today and some, some really inspiring ideas here. Um, before we sign off, I will just remind all of you that uh, you will receive the follow-up email later today with the link to the webinar recording and the slide deck. Um, please feel free to share this with your colleagues. Um, all of our recorded webinars are publicly available uh, after the fact. So uh, if you think of someone who might benefit from today's presentation, feel free to forward it on. Uh, the email will also include a survey link that you can fill out with your feedback on today's webinar. And on behalf of Charity Village, I want to thank all of you again for joining us. Um, we are keeping up with a really great lineup of webinars through the summer, including our next session on July 8th. And that's going to be a discussion about leadership transitions, including executive director and founder transitions. So you'll definitely want to check that out. We'll include a registration link in the email we send you later today. And you can also find more information about that and all of our upcoming webinars at charityvillage.com slash webinars. So thank you again for taking part in today's presentation, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.